silence. <clears throat> Normally, I start my sermons with like a grandiose story. You know, I try to extract some moment from life, my own life that's funny or insightful to try and draw us into like a human moment, you know, to draw us to think about God, but just silence. And I'll say this, y'all handled it better than first service. <laughs> you know, but it was, I don't know, uncomfortable maybe, you know. Um, some of you spoke out, like, maybe I'm supposed to speak. Like, is that what this is? What do I do here? And I would imagine that as I just stood here, silent, that some of your minds went to a few different places. My guess is that some of you might have thought, did he forget what he was going to say? Is that what this is? Some of you might have thought, oh, he has something difficult to say. He's ramping up. Others of you maybe thought like, oh, Buzzy's like doing one of his things. Okay, I'm, okay, we just got to wait this out, right? But I saw some of you not. Yeah, that was the one. I knew that one. <laughs> yeah, all just from silence. Just silence, and yet all these different responses. And silence is a strange thing because sometimes silence can be absolutely perfect. Like if, like the British cartoon that your five-year-old daughter loves to watch for hours and hours and hours. And some of the voices on that cartoon are, are voices that deep in the core of your heart you have come to hate the sound of. And then your five-year-old daughter leaves the room and you turn off the TV and you're like, oh. silence. That can be like a near-perfect moment. Other times silence can be just brutal. Some of you may or may not know that, I don't know, 15 years ago, I was pursuing uh, becoming a stand-up comedian. I was in the clubs and doing sets and uh, getting on as many stages as I could. And everybody that has pursued stand-up comedy has, at one point or another, uh, bombed. Where you got up, you didn't connect with the audience, and it was just horrible. And I might say that, um, the longest six minutes of my life was a night I got onto a stage at a comedy club, and in six minutes, and this is six minutes that I've prepared, that I've thought through, that I've rehearsed, that I've thought would be funny, in six minutes, I got one lady to kind of chuckle once, and the rest of it was dead silence. I would say the joke, maybe this, just move on to the next joke. And I have to tell you, it was six minutes of, uh, of I was like, man, if I'd give anything to just watch that British cartoon right now. Like, I just <laughs> would do. It was so horrific, man. And if you're interested to know what that might have looked like, uh, in November, Celebrate Recovery is having their anniversary party, and they've invited me to do some stand-up comedy at it. And I said, I'll do it, and you guys might be entertained, not because it's funny, but because it's not funny. But, like, you guys can take that risk, and so everybody will be invited to that. And so, like, that was excruciating. Here's why. Because I was hoping for an exchange. I was hoping for, I'll give you this, and then you guys laugh. We have this interaction. We engage, and it's back and forth. And it was all, like, just one side. It was just, ooh, there was no communication. And if you've ever been given, like, the silent treatment, you've hurt or offended a friend or someone you love, and they're like, I can't even talk to you right now. I'm going on, like, I don't know, over a decade of some people that have said, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Ooh, it hurts. It's miserable. Silence can be horrible. But... I think the worst form of it, when we as the people of God feel as though 
God has gone silent in our lives, not only can that feel devastating, but it can just make us outright desperate. And when you look through the scriptures, you see over and over that some of the patriarchs of the faith, individuals, men and women that we would go, yeah, they were pious, they were holy, and yet their experience, you know, Psalm 28, verse 1, to you, Lord, I call you, are my rock, do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit, like the psalmist here is going, God, you're silent. I'm getting nothing. I can't hear you. I can't feel you. It's what is, what's going on? Job chapter 30, verse 20, I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. Job is just, God, you're, where, you know, you got King David, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. And you look through the scripture, especially the Old Testament, and you see Job experiencing the silence of God, Abraham experiencing the silence of God, David experiencing the silence of God. You've got um, in the New Testament, like in the Old Testament, the Bible is silent when Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery and ends up in prison in Egypt, and the Bible is silent on that. There's no communication from God that's recorded. He's just in prison going, what happened? In the New Testament, you got John the Baptist in prison and silence all the way up until he's beheaded. Like the silence of God in these places seems so odd. The Old Testament, you get these pr prophets. You know, you got Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all experiencing the silence of God. Elijah, a three and a half year silence from God. And so you can't help but to like look through the scriptures and go, okay, so silence from God seems to be part of the pattern of God. It's part of the rhythm of God that you and I, if we are currently in a, in a season where we're going, God, you are being silent, man. I, I can't get to you. I can't feel you. I can't hear you. Like one reality that you have to embrace is that you're in good company because so many of these people from the scriptures are just these like beautiful, faithful people that God has gone silent on. And I absolutely cannot tell you why. Why is God silent here, not silent here? Why? I cannot give an answer for that. But I think that we can look through the scriptures and we can find some ways to kind of go, how are we to respond to that? Because sometimes these silences can be like small and they can be, you know, just for a week or, or a few days. And sometimes they can be forever. It's like what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul, a time where in utter despair you feel an absolute disconnection from the divine. And here's the reality. It's not always because of something that you have done. I believe that we can absolutely make decisions that will like distance us from God. We can make decisions that will put like blockades up between our ears and the voice of God. But you got someone like Mother Teresa faithfully serving who said that she feels like God had gone silent for decades in her life. She, and I don't imagine that she was doing anything wrong. It's just she was going, God, I just can't, can't hear you. And so I read one description of like kind of the two, they broke it down in two ways. They said, spiritually, there are times of consolation wherein you feel connected to God, you feel the presence of God, you're thriving with God, you're excited about God, you're receiving from God, you're applying these lessons and you're growing and it's great times of consolation. And then there's times of desolation where you are just begging for understanding and like you receive nothing. And it's hard to, to reconcile that that is part of the pattern of God. We see it over and over again. 
This is part of how God rhythms with us. And yet, in Luke chapter 11, we, we read Jesus say, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And these are the kind of verses that we love, right? Man, that verse talk about we're going to get. It's coming. Jesus said, you ask, you get it. You knock, you will receive. I'm going to open. Come on. People go, Pastor, just preach on that one. Not the silence verses. Just preach on this one. You know? And so, like, we go, okay, well, wait, how does Jesus say this? And yet, so often we see God's silence. And I think that we look at this and, and I go, well, Jesus doesn't say, like, how hard to knock, how often to knock, how often to ask, how long to ask. He just says, like, you got to believe that God's faithful. And sometimes we will get challenged, man, because when we want conversation, and we can't receive it the way we want it, we get desperate. Some of you know the story of my wife and I kind of falling in love. We met, um, and then we spent a couple of weeks together, and then I was to go to Europe and travel around for the summer with some friends, and so in that couple of weeks, we just fell crackers in love for each other, and so I was like, I don't want to go to Europe with my friends. I want to stay in Orange County and hang out with you, and she's like, no, you go, and I was like, I got to go, and so I'm in Europe, but all I want to do is talk to Beth. I was like, I don't care about the Louvre. I don't care about the Colosseum. I literally did not go into the Colosseum with my friends so I could go find a payphone and try to call Beth. Like, all I wanted to do was talk to Beth. And like, I didn't always have the option. And like, I couldn't figure out Europe's complicated phone systems. This is pre-cell phone. And so the only way, some of you know this, the only way I could communicate with her was to call her collect, right? Our phone bill was more than my round-trip airfare. It was egregious because why? I was so desperate. I just want to talk to her. And when we're in that place with God, when we're just kind of going, I just, I need to hear from you, man. We get desperate. We get desperate. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at this moment in the Old Testament when somebody receives this direction from God. And after they receive it, they go through this time of silence that seems like it must have been horrific so that we can look at what they did and we can maybe come up with a plan because some of you are in a time of silence right now. And if you're not in it now, there's a very good chance that it's in the mail for you because this is part of how God rhythms with people. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you guys to open your Bibles to Genesis 22. But first, if you have your Bible, hold your Bible up. I like it. If you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible, we'd love to give you one. All you got to do is slip your hand up real quick. Our ushers are in the aisles, and they will just hand you a Bible that is our gift to you. You can have it. You can keep it. Take it home. And open to Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, we see God speak something to Abraham that seems unbelievable. Look at this. Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. If this is one of the things that God will potentially speak, a lot of us would go, I'd be inclined just to take the silence. Just give me this. If you're going to tell me this, just to Because this is horrible, right? And so we read this and we go, why would God? How would God? What is this? And as we go through it, we'll see that God is doing something so much bigger here than simply just go, ah, this is just torture Abram. Abraham for a day. Like, let's just see what we can, how we can mess with this God. Because God tells Abraham to do something that, unfortunately, was common at this time. Foreign nations, worshiping other gods, believed in child sacrifice. They would do this routinely. And so at this point, like, Abraham thinks, well, this is just something that gods do. And God uses this whole passage right here to highlight to Abraham and all the descendants that would come through Abraham, 
I'm not like other gods. Other gods ask you to just sacrifice like that for them. And ultimately, if we pan back wide enough, we see that not only is God not like other gods, but God, in fact, does the very thing here that we think is horrific. We go, how could he possibly ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? That's the worst. And then we skip forward into the New Testament, and what do we see God doing? Sacrificing his son, his only son, for us. And so God is setting up the stage to say, not only am I not like other gods, because I'm not going to require this kind of thing from you. I'm not like other gods because I'm going to do that thing for you. And so this is just this an unbelievable thing. And God tells Abraham to do this. Travel to a mountain that I will show you. And then they prepare for their journey, and they do this journey in silence. Verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about on the third day. So right at the end of verse 3 and the beginning of verse 4, we have three days traveling. And our holy text completely silent on the thoughts of Abraham on the voice of God affirming, you're doing right, you're doing right, it's going to be okay. Just silence. So for three days, Abraham is moving forward, having received uh, the most recent directive from God, which all of us would look at and go, this is an impossible thing. It's an impossible ask. And yet, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. How do you move forward with God when God is being silent and you have to do something that feels impossibly difficult? How do you do it? How do you think Abraham took another step, let alone three days worth of steps? Because for many of us, we experience this silence. Some of us, you know, like, we're, we may be received from God in one area, but in another, we go, God, you're silent on this. Why is it like this? Why is this illness present? Why won't this financial situation resolve? God, why is the peace that I know of you like, just not present right now? Like, so often we just ask, we ask, we ask, and we just feel the silence. And Abraham does a couple of things that I think are, are really beautiful, like, models for us. In verse 5, it said, it reads, He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. All right, if you highlight in your Bibles, if you underline in your Bibles, if you're a Bible marker, get ready. Get a pen. Get your highlighter, okay? Because I feel like this next phrase, this next line kind of holds so much, like, potential in it. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. What do we make of this? Go sacrifice the boy. And Abraham seems to be incredibly faithful in everything he's doing, and yet he's moving towards the mountain. He's going to the place. He's got the wood. He's got everything. And he says to, like, these people, we're going to go over there, and then we're coming back. So theologians and commentarians are divided on this. There's so many different ideas about what this could possibly mean. Some would say um, maybe this is an act of uh, dissimulation where, like, he's kind of hiding his true motive. You know, he goes, I can't fess up that this is what I'm about to go do. So I'm just going to say, yeah, we're going to go do this thing. We'll be back. He's hiding the motive. Some people say maybe this was like an unconscious prophecy. I'm going to go over there. 
but then we're coming back. Some say this was his hopeful wish. Like, oh, I'm going to go, and I really want him to come back with me. And my favorite was that some theologians, some commentarians say, this is the voice of his all-conquering faith, wherein Abraham had such a faith in God that he knew, even if I follow through with this, I believe that God can bring him back to life. Like, they just here he is going, like, I am going. And it's recorded that in, in Hebrews chapter 11, a New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 11, is kind of what we call the hall of faith, wherein, like, there's just these, like, recordings of the most faithful people in the lineage of the people of God. And Abraham is noted here in Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when tested, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. This is, this is they're quoting what God had said to Abram in chapter 21 of, of Genesis. Chapter 21, verse 12, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So Abraham receives in chapter 21 this promise from God, it is through Isaac. You're going to be a father of all these nations, and through Isaac is how it's going to happen. And he believes this voice of God. He goes, this is true. I believe what God says to me is true. He's come to trust the voice. And then in chapter 20, he goes, hey, why don't you go and kill Isaac? To which... Abraham might, might, Abraham might have become like, well, wait a second. Choose one, God. But Abraham said, had such faith that he just kind of went, I don't understand it, but I believe God is good, and I'm going to move with this thing that God has told me to do and trust that this is a good God, that I'm following a good God. Some of us, we would love like near constant affirmation, especially when we're trying to follow God and doing difficult things. We would love to be told over and over, you're doing so great, you're doing so great, oh, you're doing so great, oh, I watch you pray, you're doing so great, but we don't always get it. Sometimes we've been given a directive from God, sometimes we're told to follow God and go do this thing, and then God is silent. And some of us have the ability to just know. We just have that inner peace. You know, we, we can kind of like self-affirm. I remember when my middle child, he's nine now, but he was four or five, and he was doing his preschool, like, Christmas pageant. You know, they're singing all these Christmas songs, and, you know, he's on this stage at this church with all these other kids, and he's just, just, just is out, and he's singing. And then in between some songs, you know, the, the one song ends, and there's a three or four seconds of silence before the next song begins and you know is my four-year-old son maybe five at the time and he just shouts out he goes i'm doing great <laughs> just totally confident in himself self-affirming right just i don't even need you guys i could just i know it he just yeah and some of us like can live like that no, I'm being faithful, I know, like, okay, no, I'm not hearing God, but I, I'm, I'm okay, because I'm being faithful to this thing, but like, Abraham, moving forward while God is silent, being faithful, trusting the promises already spoken. Verse 6, Abraham took the, word, the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Smart kid, right? And then, Wait a minute, something's up. We've done this before. I know this pattern, like something's missing. What's going on, Dad? What's up? And Abraham answers, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. 
and the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay him. So our minds cannot help to, but to play with this text and to play with this scene. And one of the things that my mind does is it questions Isaac. Because what young boy, presumably teenage boy, lives at that level of obedience? Right? You guys, I can't get my kids to go to bed without five or six times. I've given up on trying to get them to brush their teeth. Like, I just, it's over. I can't get them to eat food without threatening something. Like, you don't get a, no more video games today unless you eat your nuggets, whatever. It's like it just doesn't happen. And yet, here we're looking at Isaac. And you picture Abraham. Come here, boy. Let me tie you up. So now Isaac's bound. Let me lay you on this wood that you know I'm about to light on fire. Isaac lays there. And then Abraham pulls out a knife. And Isaac, in silence, complies. We don't have any record of God of telling Isaac this stuff. We don't have any record of Isaac saying, like, oh, yeah, I remember God. He told me, just, it's going to be okay. In silence. And so, the only thing that makes sense to me in this is that Abraham had lived so faithfully, so consistently, that when Isaac said, Dad, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God himself will provide. I got to believe that Isaac had watched his father say that over and over again for his entire life. Dad, how's this guy? God's going to provide. God's going to provide. And God continually provided, provided, provided. So that Isaac just went, I have learned that this God is a faithful God and that when my dad says he's going to provide, he provides. And so I'm even willing to lay down on this fire. Boom, he just trusts. He just trusts. One thing that we can take away from that, if that is in fact what happens, our kids are watching. You parents, we parents, there is such a responsibility in modeling a faithful joy in serving our Lord, in trusting our God to the point that our kids just kind of go, yeah, I've seen it. God provides. And when God seems silent and the provision doesn't come in the time that we want, I saw my parents not panic. I saw my parents not freak out about it. It's going to be okay. Our kids are watching. And so here's Abraham above his son, verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Sometimes in the silence of God, our best option is to continue moving forward with what we know God said for us to do. Like one of the things that I will often ask people if they tell me, yeah, I feel like God has gone silent. I can't hear God. I will always ask, like, what's the last thing you do remember God saying to do, and did you do it? Because if you didn't, whatever it was, confess, forgive, you know, transform, whatever it was, if you didn't do it, I think that there can be a, a place where God goes, you know what, I gotta, I'm going to back away. If you're not going to listen, okay, but I told you something. Once you do that, then I'm going to speak more. But it's not always because of something that we did or didn't do. And so in these seasons wherein we, we find ourselves just kind of going like, God's silent. What do we do? Here's a couple of things Abraham does. Abraham keeps moving and trusting God and trusting that God was and is a good God. When God is silent, one of the primary disciplines for us to engage in is to recall as many of the good things that God has done in our lives that, as we can. Like we just list them out. God, I remember when you did this. God, I remember when you did this. I remember when you showed up like this. I remember when you provided this. 
When you get attacked, when you are sick, when the finances aren't there, when you are frustrated, when God is asking you to humble yourself to people that frustrate you, all of these things, and you're going, God, is this? What is this? How is this? And you're not receiving. Like, one thing you can do right there is just kind of go like, son, God will provide the lamb. Like, he remembers how God has provided in the past. We can just rehearse how God has provided. The second thing is I think that we can always Go back to the things that we know God has already said for us to do. Sometimes that is in our own lives, and sometimes it's the scriptures. I love, I love the moment. Hold your Bibles up if you brought, I love that moment. I wish there was a way every single morning that I could just like contact everybody and go, hey, hold your Bibles up real quick if you got them, so that in your living room, in your kitchen, or driving to work, you're like, hey, my Bible's up, right? And it's like, yeah, cool, now get in it. Don't just on Sundays, but like, just because, like, if you cannot hear the voice of God in your own life right now, then you can open the scriptures and see things that God already told you to do and go, I'm just going to do those. Because as I do those and experience the peace that comes with that, as I do those, experience the joy that comes with that, as I do those and experience the freedom that comes with that, we start to get used to hearing God again. Even just the, you know, Matthew chapter 4, 5, and 6, like this sermon that Jesus preaches, there's a couple of things that he says. Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, do not put God to the test. So it's like you get in these desperate times wherein God is silent. And we can see right here that we're not to give God ultimatums. God, you better do this. God, let me see this. God, if you could do this, then I will know that you are true. God, show up. It's like, no, 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 no. Matthew 4, 10, worship God and serve him only. Right? And so we can just kind of go, what am I serving right now? What's, what has what got my worship? Matthew 4, 17, repent. You know, repent means like to turn around in your directions, to turn around in your thoughts. And so if you're in a time of silence from God, you look in this gospel, according to Matthew, and you can read this thing, go, Jesus told me to repent. Let me just seek through my life. Is there something to repent from? Resolve your anger. Matthew 5, 22. Anybody here got anything in your life that has caused you some anger that you have avoided? stuff it down, ignore it. Is God silent? You go back to the scripture and you read this, resolve your anger. That might be the thing right there that God is just going, hey, that one's for you. And you just keep going through. Be reconciled to anyone who has anything against you. Matthew 5, 23. And that one's rough, man. Because people that have things against you or that you have things against, there are people like right now, that I, I might do well to just kind of go, look, man, I'll just see you in glory. Like, but we, I never need to see you in Starbucks again. Like, heaven, we'll get a coffee maybe, but like on this side of the heartbeat, I'm done with you. You know, like, there's just some people that have wronged you or hurt you, and that's where you're at. And then you get to this thing where Jesus goes, oh, yeah, be reconciled to anyone who has anything against you. It's like, oh, God, really? That's for me? That's what you want? Settle matters quickly. Anything that makes you stumble, anything, get rid of it. Give to the one who asks. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Give anonymously. Pray secretly. You just go back to the scriptures. If God is silent, you go back to the things that you know God has already spoken for us to do and just go, I will do those until I start to hear the voice again in my own life. And here's the other thing. If you're in a time of silence right now, or you, it comes in the future, remember this, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. We can be disappointed in the silence. We can grieve the silence. But you know what? We are not to be surprised by the silence. Peter says, don't be surprised at this. And this final verse I want to share is just this blanket of peace that I hope you get to put over you if and you ever experience the silence of God. And then we're going to go into a time of prayer. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior, he will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. If you're experiencing silence from God, I want to suggest that perhaps God is simply being quiet in his love for you. 
And so if the silence to you feels like a rejection or an abandonment, receive that scripture and know that God's love is constant even if his voice is silent. So I want to do this. I want to go into a time of prayer. And here's how I do this. Here's how I invite you to do this. I always ask that you set down your Bible or set down your purse, whatever's on your lap, just get it, you know, to where you're not distracted by something. And I love to invite people to sit up in your, in your seats, you know, like get comfortable. And then um, do this with me. You keep your eyes open or closed, however you want. But we're going into just a time of prayer. And I want to ask you to do this. Take a, take a breath in. Then exhale. Recognize that you are putting yourself in a posture to receive something from God right now. You're clearing your head and focusing on God, centering your thoughts on Christ. You're removing your idea for the rest of your day, and you're just going to be present in this moment. God, we want your voice in our lives. Some of us are in a time of silence right now from you. And maybe it's peaceful to read in the scriptures that sometimes you are quiet in your love. And some of us, maybe just your, your silence is, is just really, really tough right now. So, Lord, we want to come before you with an expectant heart and expectant ears to hear from you, to receive from you. And so I would invite everybody here in the silence of your mind, the silence of your heart, pray this. God, is there anything you have asked me to do that I simply haven't done? And then just see what thought comes to your mind. God, is there anything you've asked me to do I simply haven't done? God might bring a specific part of your life to your mind and say, trust me here. I asked you to trust me here and you still haven't. God might bring somebody to your mind that God has told you to forgive. I told you to forgive this person. You're still bitter. What's up? God, is there anything you've asked me to do that I still simply just haven't done? If you heard something there or thought came to your mind, I would invite you just to say, God, I commit to act on that. I will do it. I will follow through. And now pray this. God, I do want to hear your voice, even if you have something difficult to say. What would you want to say to me right now? God, we thank you for the ways that you love us. We ask that you will continue to speak. Lord, I ask that even right now as we're sitting in these postures to receive, and hopefully you're speaking clearly to many of us, I pray that this is something that we will get used to doing regularly, if not daily. Just asking for your voice, asking for your direction, asking for your presence. Thank you for exulting over us with shouts of joy. And Lord, we even thank you for the times that you are quiet in your love for us. In the power of your precious name we pray, amen. Amen.